Hey folks, it's that time again, the time where I make a video while barely trying to make a video. It's a not actually Trek actually comment response video where you, my wonderful viewers, have done most of the work for me, for which I am grateful and which will not stop me from asking you to become a financial supporter of this channel at the end of the video, but we're not there yet. I still have to kind of sort of do something to generate content. So with that in mind, let's get to the first comment. And that first comment comes from a batch of comments selected from the video I put up last week about the Klingon characters in Star Trek movies. And this first one is from Langley M. Neely, who says, Funny enough, the Klingon dictionary had the opposite effect on 14-year-old me. I was in the hospital often as a kid, and constant airing of syndicated Trek shows became my go-to show to keep me company. Getting a copy of the dictionary as a gift, which I read backwards and forwards, was a key point in realizing, oh, crap, I'm a Star Trek nerd? A deep, deep Star Trek nerd? Hmm. I figured out who I am! Kapla! Well, that is really cool. I am very glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean... I, I went through kind of a, I mean, it sounds way more exotic and interesting than it is, because keep in mind, we're talking about Star Trek. But I went through kind of an experimental phase, I guess, where I was kind of trying to figure out what kind of Star Trek fan I was. And this just sort of speaks to what a, a boring, bland, middle of the road person I am. Like, I've never had any feeling that, like, I needed to explore my sexuality or my identity or, you know, anything like that. Like, I'm as vanilla of a human being as you can possibly be as far as most of the really important aspects of human nature go. But with my Star Trek fandom, I went through a little phase in my adolescence and early adulthood where I was like, what kind of a Star Trek fan am I? And yeah, there was the Klingon Dictionary, and I was like, no, I'm not really into that. There was, you know, fanfic and stuff like that. And even though I've written some fanfic, uh, even written some fanfic in the in the past few years, like, I never really got super into it as a way of, like, being a fan. Like, I've never really been into reading other people's fanfic. I've found most of it tedious at best. Um, but, you know, but a lot of other people are super into it. And that is a major point of connection for them. For me, not so much. But I tried it. I sort of experimented. And eventually I landed on where I am now with it, which is I'm here for the stories. I'm here for the characters. I treat it no differently than I treat any other, you know, film or TV show or book or whatever. I'm, I'm here to be interested in the stories and the characters and what do the writers and, and the performers and the creators of this thing have to say, what are they trying to tell me? What are they trying to share with me? What are we connecting through? You know, like that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of fan that I am. And you're the kind of fan you are. And we sound like we are very different kinds of fans in terms of what parts of the thing we're most attracted to. And yet we are both fans of the same thing. Isn't that wonderful? Here's one from Opinions No One Cares About. Actually, in Generations, the Enterprise blew up Chang's ship from the previous movie in an obvious reuse of footage. Guess they blew most of the budget on the stellar cartography scene. Since you bring it up in this comment, I, I feel like I didn't give Lursa and Baytor their due credit because I kind of brushed them off in the video where I say that, you know, they, they attack the Enterprise, but then they get blown up pretty quickly. And that's the end of them. And it's a very anticlimactic death for Lursa and Bator. And I stand by all of that. That is true. But I neglected to acknowledge that they do manage to damage the Enterprise badly enough that it crashes. Like, they do destroy the Enterprise D. Now, they're dead by the time it is actually destroyed, but it was their damage that destroyed it. So I feel like they get, you know, a little bit of credit for that. So, you know, good job, ladies. Blue Beetle 1939, I actually think surprise Klingons in a romantic comedy might work really well. They can be the fiancé who cheats on the main character's love interest. Right, this is from the bit that I said near the end of the video where I recommended if you want to give your movie that undeniable Star Trek feeling, put some Klingons in it, but, you know, make sure that it's a Star Trek movie or otherwise people might get confused. And Blue Beetle here is saying, no, throw some Klingons in a romantic comedy. That could be fun. And you know what? I, I have this counterproposal. I think this is a great idea, but 
making the Klingon be the guy who the fiancé cheats on with feels like a little bit of an obvious casting choice. Not that it couldn't work, I'm not saying that, but if you wanted to go a little more outside the box and be a little more creative with it, make the Klingon be like the sensitive guy that the girl ends up with. Make the Klingon be Mr. Right. And, you know, maybe he's still like a typical Klingon. He's like a big, tough, intimidating, you know, physical guy. But he also has a good heart. And he's sensitive. And he listens to her. And he wants to do things that she wants to do. And he asks her about her day and is genuinely interested when she talks to him. And, you know, he's like a really good boyfriend. And is also a typical Klingon. I think that has a little bit of potential as well. Let's, let's make that happen, Paramount. Here's one from Felix Ozolina. I've watched a lot of your videos, but can't remember if you've ever mentioned your views on Tolkien's work. Given your general disinterest in Con Lang's and world building, I would kind of assume you've never gotten into them at all, since that's arguably 90% of that fictional universe, but I'm curious if I'm right. You're right. Now, these next several comments are from my video reviewing the second season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. This one is from DM121984. In Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, a small but great moment for me is how Alt-Kirk is against fixing the timeline because he and his reality won't exist anymore, and he maintains that position until La'an accidentally mentions his brother being alive, and Kirk is just stunned by this, and immediately after that point, he's totally on board with restoring the timeline. Classic Kirk. The thing that flips his decision is the emotional link to his family and friends. He could be very logical in TOS, but he was so loyal to Spock and McCoy, he would often break the rules to save them. I was impressed by that for a couple of reasons. First, you're right, it's, it's perfect characterization for Kirk. It feels like in line with the Kirks that we've seen in the past. You know, it's a very Kirk way of thinking and a very Kirk thing to do. And also, it acknowledges what would be an issue between these two characters if they were real people in this real situation, as far-fetched as it is. If La'an succeeds in restoring her timeline, she destroys Kirk's timeline. So Kirk being from the timeline that's going to be destroyed would have a problem with that, you would think. Like, as bad as his timeline is compared to La'an's, he only has her word for it that it's so much worse, and it's the only world he's ever known. So why would he be on board with getting rid of it. Aha, why would he? Because in the other timeline, his brother is still alive. And that means so much to him that he is willing to sacrifice his entire life that he has known it up to this point for an alternate life that he cannot possibly know what it's going to be like because his brother is alive in it. It's really, it's good character writing and it's smart writing because it acknowledges that this character would have a reasonable objection to going along with La'an, but then they resolve it in a very human way that, that speaks to, to the character. It's, it's really, really well done. Really well done. And one of the things that makes that such a fantastic episode, one of the best episodes of the season, I thought. Here's one from Vigrant Pulley Patty. Regarding Under the Cloak of War, for me, the near delirious panic in Chapel's voice when she realized the Klingons were massacring children was what sold the hellish reality of that fictional war. The portrayals in that episode were phenomenal. We don't see a single battle, you know, like a proper battle in the episode. We see the um, the, the lead up to it and the aftermath of it. We see people going out and coming back. And yet, because that feels real the battle itself, the war itself, feels real. You know, it's, it's, it's a good reminder that that's what's really important. When you're telling stories, when you're creating fiction, um, the emotional reality needs to be there. Or it doesn't matter how realistic it looks, how realistic it sounds, how many little details you get right. None of that matters if it doesn't feel emotionally real when the audience watches it. And this episode of Strange in Your Worlds gets that emotional reality right, and that's why it works. This next comment is from Andrew Anastasovsky. I noticed you didn't mention the Klingons in Subspace Rhapsody. I was kind of only half watching because I was doing something else, and songs can convey plot points without having to listen very closely until the Klingons. I always focus more closely whenever Klingons show up, and their performance got a good laugh of appreciation out of me that time. Yeah, I didn't mention them, but I, I did really like that joke. 
I felt like the episode did a good job of kind of teasing it because when they first mentioned the possibility of the uh, the musical effect spreading first spreading beyond the Enterprise and then spreading beyond the Federation to Klingons and Romulans. Like somebody mentions the possibility of Klingons singing and I think they give Pike a reaction shot there where he's like, ooh, you know, like we don't want to see that. So they kind of set you up for it and give you a reason to expect that maybe we're going to see this at some point. And then they don't disappoint. They fulfill that expectation and we see the Klingons and, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's short you know, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's just long enough to register as here's the Klingons reluctantly taking part in the musical in a, you know, singing a, a style of music that they probably would not choose to be singing were it completely up to them. And yeah, I thought it worked really well. It was really funny. I liked it a lot. So j just because I didn't mention it uh, in the review doesn't mean that like I, I don't think it's worth mentioning or I, or I didn't like it for some reason. I thought it was very well done and it got a laugh out of me too. And here's one more about Strange New World Season 2 from George Sheridan. In my humble opinion, number one's trial should not have been resolved so quickly. It could have been a season-long arc, resolved in time for her to participate in the action of the last few eps of the season. Yeah, we really disagree there, George. I, I mean, you're right in the sense that it could have been. Like, yes, they could have stretched it out to make it a season-long arc, but I really don't see how it would have been better if they had. I mean, I think... Um, introducing it in episode one and then having episode one be about something else. And even though I, even though episode one was my least favorite episode of the season, I still like the way they, they, in, they reintroduced number one situation and said, okay, you know, she's been held in custody ever since the end of season one. And this is her situation. And Captain Pike's going off to try and do something to help. And now here's an episode about something else. And then episode two, they come back to it. And episode two is the resolution. You know, so they set it up in episode one, and then the episode's about something else, and then episode two, it takes center stage, and that episode is about number one's predicament and number one's court martial, and it's resolved by the end of the episode. I think it's, I think it's perfect just the way it is. Like, I really don't see how it would have helped the story to drag it out any longer. I mean, could they have? Yes, they could have. Would that have helped the season? Would that have helped that particular story? I don't think so. I mean, just because you can tell a story in, you know, five or six episodes doesn't mean you should. In fact, I think it's exactly the opposite. If you can tell a story in five or six episodes, but you can also tell the same story in one episode and have it be just as impactful, if not more so, then do that. Now, these next few comments are from my video about why Spock is actually the most important character in Star Trek. This one is from Mr. Fear Dub, who says, I love how Leonard Nimoy knew that Spock wouldn't punch the bad guys out and told the showrunners that and offered an alternative, the Vulcan neck pinch, as a calm, level-headed alternative to how they initially wanted him to act. From what I can tell, Leonard Nimoy was a very selfless actor, was an actor who cared about the character he was playing and cared about how the character fit into the larger project. You know, he wasn't trying to make it the Leonard Nimoy show. Uh, he wasn't trying to make it the Spock show. He seems to have had a very thoughtful attitude toward the character and the character's place in the overall context of the series and how the character would act in a given circumstance, and, and if the writers wrote something that he felt was wrong for Spock, uh, he would speak up about it. And he would say, actually, I don't know if Spock would do that. Maybe Spock would do this instead. And his instincts were usually right, because he had a very strong read on this character. Like he, f When he figured it out, and one of the things I talk about in that video, as you can see in the early episodes, he's kind of figuring it out. He doesn't have it dialed in yet, but by, you know, early on in this in the first season of Star Trek, um, he's pretty much got it and holds on to it for, you know, the rest of his career as he plays the character. And when he had it, he had it. Like, he knew who that guy was. Leonard Nimoy knew who Spock was. And if Spock was scripted to do something un-Spock-like, Nimoy would say, I don't think he would do that. I think he would do this instead. And and he uh, not only stuck up for himself as an actor and stuck up for his character, but did it in a way that was not self-serving, but served the character and served the story that they were making. That is a, 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 a very wonderful quality for, for any artist 
to have, to be able to set their own ego aside um, and say, what would this character do? What would this mean for the story that we're trying to tell? And is this the right thing? Leonard Nimoy was that kind of an actor and that kind of collaborator. And that's one of the reasons why he was so great and why he was, you know, so beloved by the people who worked with him. This one is from Queen Anne's Revenge. I respect Zachary Quinto's portrayal, but I do feel like Ethan Peck captures the Nimoy vibe better. I also believe, superficial as it sounds, that the deeper voice helps him feel more like Spock. Quinto scared the hell out of me as Silar, but I just can't get into his Spock. We have a character in Spock who has now been played three different ways by three different very talented, very effective actors. They've all done it their own way. They've all brought their own uh, interpretation to it and thankfully been given the freedom to do that. You know, Zachary Quinto and Ethan Peck have not, uh, have not been told, do Leonard Nimoy. We just want another Leonard Nimoy. They've been given the space and the freedom to create their own character. Um, but all three are Spock. And all three are recognizable as Spock. And all three feel like Spock. And I, I've said before, when... Um, when Ethan Peck first started playing him in Discovery, I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know about this. And it took me a couple of episodes to kind of dial into him. And then once I, I sort of warmed up to his version of Spock, I realized that I really liked it. And I have really liked it from the beginning of Strange New Worlds. Like, I think Ethan Peck is a fantastic Spock. Very, very similar to Leonard Nimoy in a lot of ways. Very different from Leonard Nimoy in a lot of ways. They're supposed to be the exact same person, right? It's not even an alternate universe. Like Zachary Quinto is playing the same person too, but he's playing the same person in an alternate universe. So you could say, well, maybe he's a little different because, you know, events, blah, blah, blah. It's a different timeline. Um, Ethan Peck's Spock is supposed to literally be the same individual as, as Leonard Nimoy's Spock in TOS. And yet he plays him in a different way. Um, he feels like he's giving his own performance. He is contributing his own uh, qualities to the character as an actor. It still feels like plausibly the same person. You know, it still feels like they're both kind of doing the same thing, but in their own unique ways. And it's just, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. I, I really, really enjoy the fact that we now have three similar but different and all excellent Spocks in the uh in the star trek franchise it's 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 pretty cool and one last one from the spock video this is from dagashi the llama why do i so often end up with tears in my eyes when i listen to you ramble on so passionately about the best trek has to offer thanks again mr shives what's the point of having a canon if you don't care about the stories what's the point of having characters if you don't care about the stories if you don't care about the characters What's the point of having ships and planets and aliens and costumes and all of the other technical details that, you know, certain fans seem to just be fascinated by to the exclusion of everything else? What's the point of all that stuff? If it's not part of a story that means something to you, that tells you something about yourself, that tells you something about the world, that tells you something about those characters that you can relate to, that tells you something about the potential of humanity that tells you something about things we're doing wrong that we should try to do better whatever whatever it is whatever parts of the story mean something to you or, or you find compelling that's it like without that none of this means anything and if i can get that across to some of you in these videos then i am i am humbly grateful that you know you think i've accomplished that so thank you but like it's not I, I only deserve partial credit. It's the, it's the stories that got me all, um, you know, involved in them in the first place that deserve most of the credit and, and, you know, fundamentally the people who created those stories. Now, these next several comments are from my video about Star Trek's best first officers. This one is from Dr. Shaunify. I've always had the idea that Riker passed up on his own commands repeatedly because of how much he enjoyed his job versus what Picard's job looked like to him. This is a really funny twist on something that I do think is actually in the show. They don't really hit this note very hard, but I think Riker, I think just one time uh, Riker responds to Picard. I think it's in the best of both worlds, actually, when um, Riker is offered the command of, of uh, Admiral Hansen's ship, the Melbourne, I think it is. And um, it's the scene where Picard says to Riker, what the hell are you still doing here? 
And Riker's like, huh? And Picard says, you've been offered promotion. You could be the captain of the Melbourne. She's a fine ship. And Riker just kind of, you know, cocks his head and goes, well, but she's not the Enterprise. You know, so there's that that implication that, well, you know, if Picard were to move on, Riker would certainly accept promotion to be captain of the Enterprise, but he doesn't want to be the captain of just some other ship, you know. So there's there's that sort of implication that, you know, he's he's you know, he's happy with his job on the Enterprise. He likes his job on the Enterprise. If he's gonna get promoted to captain, he would like to be the captain of the Enterprise, please. And if he can't, then he'd rather just remain the first officer of the Enterprise. Um, but I really like the <laughs> the twist that you have thrown in, which is it's not just that Riker likes his job on the Enterprise and would prefer being the first officer of the Enterprise to being the captain of some other ship. It's specifically he thinks Picard's job looks like no fun at all. <laughs> and he's like, oh, Jesus, if that's what being a captain is like, then no, I'd rather just keep my current gig. Thanks, but no thanks. Like, I think that's a really funny twist <laughs> on uh, on why, why is Riker still here. I like that a lot. <laughs> Here's one from Virgil38. My chaos vote is for Damar. Damar was a good first officer until he wasn't, at least from Ducat's point of view. I feel like Damar and Ducat kind of parted company when Ducat started to go a little nuts. And Damar was like, ah, this is too far even for me, boss. I think we're going to, we're not, this, we're not going to be a team anymore. Um, so I think, you know, uh, Ducat probably considered Damar to be a poor first officer after a certain point. But uh, yeah, Damar was, our, and you know, he, he was a good first officer from the Federation's perspective in the long run because he ended up leading a uh, a resistance movement <laughs> to the uh, the Cardassian and uh, Dominion alliance there. So yeah, good job, Damar. Not a bad first officer. You know, we we may not have been able to win the war without you, buddy. Hey, you know, and then he died. So good for him. Here's one from Disky01. Kira had to run a station full of non-Starfleet Bajaran people constantly coming and going, tense interactions with a race who very recently occupied her homeworld, a war with the Dominion, internal political and religious strife, and she had to do it all in a very tight jumpsuit. It's Kira all the way. Oh, there's definitely a case to be made that it is Kira, that Kira deserves to be considered the best first officer we've ever seen on a Star Trek show. I mean, uh, and I think, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this much, I still think I would go with Riker, um, but I'll give you this much. Based on what we see in the shows, I think Kira's job is the toughest for all the reasons you mentioned. I mean, she's not just the first officer of a ship in Starfleet. She's the first officer of a space station with members of multiple services working together and having to interface, plus the Bajaran stuff, plus the Cardassian stuff, plus the wormhole right over there, right? I mean, she has so much to manage and so many different masters to serve and so many different responsibilities to take care of on a daily basis that it's it's ridiculous. And the fact that she can do any of it and maintain some semblance of sanity is remarkable. So um, just based on difficulty of the job, I think you would have an excellent argument to say, no, it's got to be Kira. Unfortunately, Kira does not have a very, very general physical resemblance to me. So, unfortunately, it couldn't be her. It had to be Riker. And one more from the Best First Officers video. This one is from Richard Autism, who says... Would you consider doing a video discussing the potential merits for number one becoming captain of the Enterprise in Strange New Worlds between Pike and Kirk? To make number one captain of the Enterprise, unless you have a really good reason, and by really good reason, I mean a really good story to tell about her being the captain of the Enterprise. It feels like, well, number one is such a great character, and she was such a good first officer for all those years, and it just seems a shame that, you know, she would never get to be captain of the Enterprise. So let's make her captain of the Enterprise in between Pike and Kirk, just so we can, just so she can say that she was the captain. Like, no, no. <laughs> that's not a good reason. That's not good storytelling. That's, that's, that's wish fulfillment for fans that that really like that character and can't maintain an appropriate distance from it as far as I'm concerned. You know, I love number one. She's she's a fantastic character. But unless you have a story that will 
make it worth making her the captain of the Enterprise, I, I just don't see what the point of it is. So, no, I, I, I've never thought of making a video about it. And I would be, if, if I were, you know, in charge of the creative direction of that show, I would be very, very hesitant to do that. Uh, just because it's like, why, why? Because we, because we like her character. I mean, I love her character, but if you like the character, then do right by them in the story. And that doesn't mean giving them a prize that'll mean something to the fans. That means telling a good story about them. These next several comments are from my video about Star Trek's attitude toward euthanasia. This one is from Destructionator. The first episode that comes to my mind on the topic is Yesteryear, with young Spock being forced to face his first no-win scenario. Oh boy, I screwed this one up, didn't I? I mean, I, I'm not retracting the video or anything, like the video is what it is, and I'm still very proud of the, of the euthanasia video, but yeah, after I finished it and uploaded it, even before people started to comment, I, the, the, the thought kind of drifted into my mind, oh, Spock put his pet down. In yesteryear, shit, I didn't even mention that, <laughs> and I realized that was a a, a pretty big oversight. Um, I mean, it probably wouldn't have changed the arc of the video very much at all, but it would have been nice to at least acknowledge that there was a literal act of euthanasia in Star Trek: The Animated Series, and it's the kind of euthanasia, unfortunately, that most of us will probably have to experience. Uh, at some point in our lives, which is the euthanasia of a pet, you know? Uh, so it probably would have been a good idea to at least mention that that happened, and I didn't mention it at all in the video. So that is my bad. And uh, thank you to everybody who mentioned it in the comments and pointed it out. Because uh, yes, that is certainly... And and it's, it's, it's depicted in... Um, in a way that I think is consistent with the rest of what I say in the video with, with Star Trek's overall attitude toward it, which is that it is a sad, but sometimes necessary and, and appropriate thing, you know, whether it's an animal or a person. Uh, but yes, the first time that a, we see a character actually have to make that choice is in Star Trek, the animated series in yesteryear, the best episode of Star Trek, the animated series, which I have talked about in other videos, but probably should have mentioned in the euthanasia video and didn't slip my mind. I know this will be a shock to many of you. And it's a shock to me whenever I am occasionally reminded of it, but I am not perfect. Here's one from Cuddy Wifter. Thank you for this. Back in the summer of 1989, I went with my dad to see Star Trek V. Despite its flaws, McCoy's scene touched us deeply, so much so that my father said, if this happens to me, son, make sure I'm not in pain. Fast forward to 2020. Dad had been suffering from Parkinson's since 2013. It got so bad, he just wanted to be out of pain. By 2020, he was rushed into hospital. He was dying, but still in pain. I remembered what he said back then. I just wanted him out of pain. As with Nimoy, they increased his morphine, until he passed away in his sleep. No more pain now, Dad. You say thanks to me at the beginning of that. Thanks to you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I am very, very lucky that I have I have never had to do that to date. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, both my parents are still alive. Who knows what the future holds? But hopefully I will not be faced with that situation. Um but I remember, I, I, I will say this, and I almost wrote this in the video, but I, I left it out when I got to the, the Leonard Nimoy part. Um, Leonard Nimoy died of complications from um, COPD, and so did my paternal grandfather. He had emphysema that basically depleted him and deflated him gradually for the final several years of his life. Like he went from a very active, healthy, robust guy into a guy who could hardly breathe and could barely walk on his own. And then at the very end, couldn't walk on his own and, and eventually couldn't breathe. And, and he technically died of kidney failure, but it was a complication of the emphysema. And, um, and he, uh, he, he did have a living will, 
that said uh, no extraordinary measures to bring me back, right? If I if if I start to go, like you know, just let me go. But he never expressed any desire, you know, to be euthanized. He never asked for more morphine. You know, he never said, you know, the pain's too much. You know, just let me go. Just let me rest. He never he never did that. Um, nor had he expressed any desire for that in the past. You know, he never said the kind of thing that, that your father said to you. Um, but having watched him in those final days, having been in his hospital bed, having talked to him, I think the day before he died, uh, was the last time I actually got to speak with him. And then the day, the, the last time I saw him, which turned out to be the day he died, he was unconscious all day. Um, and I remember seeing him in the bed and I remember how small he looked in the hospital bed. And, and I mean, he just, he looked like a balloon with all the air let out of it. Like he was just, you know, exhausted. He just looked exhausted. Um, and I think he was afraid to die. Like I, I know he didn't want to die and I think he was afraid to die for whatever reason. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm afraid to die too. I'm afraid to die because I hate the thought of not existing. Like the thought of not existing terrifies me. And I'm really not comfortable with the fact that someday I'm going to not exist anymore. Uh, I don't know if that was what Pap was afraid of or if he had some other reason to be afraid of death or whatever. I, I We never actually talked about it. But I think he was afraid to die. And um, he finally, he did. He, he, he died. And... You know, he, he didn't, like I said, he didn't ask to be put out of his misery. He never expressed any desire to be put out of his misery um, or to end his suffering. Um, but having seen his condition and having seen how he was his last few days, I completely get it. Like, I completely understand why someone would ask for that in a similar situation. I can only assume that Leonard Nimoy's condition was not unlike that of my grandfather in his final days, you know, and Leonard Nimoy, for his own sake, for, you know, for his choice, he said, let's, let's just end this, you know, and got the extra morphine and went to sleep and, and that was the end of it. And I, I completely get it. Like, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and it's, a sad thing, but it's a choice that people have the right to make. And I, you know, I, I think Leonard Nimoy and, and his wife and his caregivers made the right decision for him. And, um, and it sounds like you made the right decision for your dad. So, yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Here's one from St. Anselm's Fire. Man, Death Wish was Voyager pulling out all stops to make a good episode. They had a comet, a courtroom, a crossover, and even Q. It had to be a great episode. You know, incredibly, I've never thought of it like that, but you are absolutely right. They threw every bell and whistle into that episode so that it just, it had no choice but to be good. Like, they threw every trick that they knew into that. They're like, this, no, this... I know a lot of people have been underwhelmed by this show so far. This is going to be a great episode, goddammit. We are not going to give it any choice. We're going to throw everything at it, and this will be a great episode. And it worked. <laughs> like, it worked. You're right. Um, it has a comet, which always portends a good Star Trek episode. It's a courtroom episode, which I don't know if I would say every courtroom episode is great, but that's a pretty high success percentage. Um it's a crossover, because not only is Q there, but Riker's there too. And yeah, and Q's there. So, like, how could it not be a good episode? And, you know, but it, you know what it reminds me of, though? Because, like, it's one of the high points of Voyager. I don't think it's quite my favorite Voyager episode, but it's, like, top two or three easily. Like, it's way up there. Death Wish is a really, really, really good episode of Voyager. One of the best Voyager episodes they ever did. Um... But, you know, the average of the series is way below that. Most of them were not anywhere near as good as Death Wish. And, you know, they they can't pull out all the stops every single episode. They can't do a courtroom show or a Q show or a Riker episode or whatever. Like, they can't do that every single week. Um, it reminds me of, you remember, if anybody's old enough and was paying attention to boxing 
or sports in general at the time. Back in 1990, I think, 1990, 1991, uh, Mike Tyson lost the world heavyweight title. Uh, he got knocked out by a virtual unknown named Buster Douglas, James Buster Douglas. Um, it was 1990. It was 1990. I remember because um, Mike Tyson had been scheduled to be the special referee of a match between Hulk Hogan and Macho King Randy Savage on an episode of uh, Saturday night's main event, or actually the main event that was going to be on Friday night. Um, and Mike Tyson was going to be the special referee for this match. It was promoted as like this big thing, like Mike Tyson, the heavyweight champion of the world is going to be on the main event with Hogan and Savage. And he's going to be the special referee. And this was 1990. This was, um, eight years before he did his, he did something very similar at WrestleMania, right? Um, and then Tyson lost the title. Like he had a fight a couple weeks before he was supposed to do this wrestling show and he got beat and he had never been beaten before. And this guy, Buster Douglas, who everybody kind of thought was a tomato can, beat Mike Tyson and won the heavyweight title. And then Buster Douglas was the special referee <laughs> of, of the match with Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is after Buster Douglas won, I went with my dad um, and, we, and we went to visit a friend of his. And my dad and his friend were talking about the fight. And my dad's friend mentioned that Buster Douglas had dedicated the fight to his mom. Apparently, Buster Douglas's mom had just passed away very shortly before the fight. And Buster Douglas and his mom were very close. And so he dedicated the fight to his mom. And, and he, he, con he contributed his victory to, you know, the extra motivation of, of, of fighting for the memory of his dearly departed mother. Right. And that's how he defeated Mike Tyson. And uh, Hank, my dad's friend, said, well, you know, the only problem with that is he only had one mother. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like that's Voyager. That's Voyager and, and Death Wish. It's like, yeah, it's a great episode. The only problem with that is they can't bring Q back next week. I mean, they could, but it wouldn't mean as much. You know, they can't bring Riker back next week. They can't they can't do this kind of a show every show. You know, they're going to have to make it on their own at some point. And instead, it was Voyager. And really, isn't that the perfect metaphor for Star Trek Voyager? It's the James Buster Douglas of the Star Trek franchise. I mean, when it's good, it's as good as anybody ever was. But it's not that good very often, is it? This comment is from Andrea Reventon, who says, We've said it before, but Picard Season 1's ending with Data asking to be allowed to die is one of our favorite moments of modern Trek because of how it reflects the subject of autonomy like these episodes do. It's well acted, it's well written, it feels true to both characters, and yeah, that is a scene where Data is essentially asking for an assisted suicide. He's asking to be euthanized. He's saying, uh, when you get back out into the real world, pull the plug on me. They're like, I, I want to die. I want to experience mortality. I don't want to continue existing like this. Um, and Picard does it. And it's a very tasteful and, and melancholy and, and well done scene. And then they completely overwrite it and change it and ignore it and disrespect it in season three of Picard because they wanted to get the toy box. They wanted to get the toy back out of the box, you know, because that's how characters are treated in that season. They're toys. They're these guys. They're these guys. That's how, that's how they, that, that's how the writing of Picard season three feels. It's like, yeah, you know, they killed data at the end of season one and it was really well done and it was beautiful. And, you know, the character was finally at peace, but, oh, we want him back for season three. Get the toy out of the box. That's how we're writing this. They're not characters. They're action figures. Time to play with our toys. The fans like to see us play with our toys. So we're going to play with our toys. That was season three. But yeah, that ending of season one for Data was beautiful. And one more from the euthanasia video. This is from Rob Squared. Honestly, I do think children should be responsible for their parents in old age. Not because it's a transactional thing, but because they love them and actually care about them. That's the common thing in a lot of societies. America was kind of a pioneer in breaking up extended families. The ideal situation is if you have children, you were a good enough parent to them, and you and your children are close enough that if you ever do get into the situation as an older person where you can't take care of yourself anymore, and your kids are in a position to 
take care of you, that they will do so because they want to, because they love you and your family. And that's the way it is. Like there's no, of course, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's beautiful. That's the way it should be. My problem with <laughs> what Loxana says in the episode is that she says it like it's an entitlement, you know? Like, what Timison says is completely reasonable. Timison says, no parent should expect to be paid back for the love they show their children. And I agree with that. You're not entitled to it. It's not, yeah, like, like I mean, I think we're on the same page here. Um, in your comment, you say it shouldn't be transactional. And that's what Timison is saying. You love your children because you love your children. You You raise your children and take care of them and do right by them because you're their parent. And that's your job. And you want to, because you love them. And, you know, if they then need to take care of you, they should do so because they love you. And because it's because then it's their job, and they're happy to do it, and they want to do it, because they love you, because you're family. But you shouldn't expect it. You shouldn't feel entitled to it. You know, you shouldn't feel like you are do it. Like, okay, I raised you, now you take care of me. Like, that's not how it should work. But apparently, Lawaxana thinks that's exactly how it should work. That's exactly how it should work. Because her response to that is, well, why the hell not? Why shouldn't a parent expect to be paid back for the love they show their children? And the reason, the reason she says that is because she's a horrible, narcissistic person. And this last batch of comments is taken, appropriately enough, from my video ranking the series finales of Star Trek The Next Generation. This person is from Daniil J, who says... Honestly, All Good Things is one of the best TV series finales of all time. They hit the mark perfectly. I agree. When I try to think of other series finales that are as good or better than All Good Things, I, I honestly have kind of a hard time. There are a few that I can think of, but not many. I mean, that's what's so great about All Good Things is that... It's not only the best Star Trek series finale, like of any of the shows. It is also one of the best episodes of TNG, just period. It's just a good episode. It's a great episode. But yeah, it's also one of the best series finales of anything. Star Trek, sci-fi, adventure, fantasy, whatever. Like, name the genre. Drama, comedy, whatever. Like, open it up to all final episodes of all TV shows. Um, All Good Things is one of the very, very best series finales ever. Like, they just nailed it. They stuck the landing. I, that's, that's a phrase I use a lot. You know, like, even if you kind of wander off a little bit, you can get it all back. You can redeem yourself if you just stick the landing. And Season 7 of TNG is kind of like that. Season 7 of TNG is not the show at its best. I mean, it's not as bad as like season one, not even close, but it kind of, it's off the peak creatively. You know, season four, five, six of TNG, like that's, ooh, oh, that's good. You know, season seven, it's kind of, well, okay, this feels like this might be over, you know, but man, did they stick the landing. They come back for the last episode and they absolutely nail it. Fantastic. Could not ask for better. And so far in Star Trek, haven't gotten better. <laughs> There's one from Unag. In my opinion, a good finale feels like a new beginning, not an ending. This is why I think it worked. You see the crew moving forward, relating to one another in a new way. It's really nice if you can end it on a note of completion, but also continuation. You know, where you feel like the section of these people's lives that we get to see through the movie or the show or whatever, like that part is over and it feels over, and it feels like we don't need to see anymore. Like, it's done. We feel satiated. We, we feel like a sense of completion. Um, but you also get the sense that after the final fade out, their lives are going to continue, you know, and we're not going to know about it. We're not going to see it. But life will go on, and there are new adventures ahead, and they're, and they're going to be okay. You know, maybe they're going to be moving in different directions. Maybe they will be separated from each other in a way that they weren't during the show. Or maybe they will be together in different ways or whatever. Something will be different. Um, a chapter will have concluded. A very important, significant chapter will have concluded and it will be over. Um, and our participation in their lives will be over. 
but it will go on, you know? Uh, that's a really nice note to end it on as well. And I, I really I really like that when you can craft an ending of that kind. Um, but you can also end it where it's like, oh, that's it. You know, that's the end because that's the end. Um, both can work in the right circumstance if they are if they're executed well. But yeah, the life goes on ending can be very good. And certainly that's the kind of ending that All Good Things was for um, not just artistic reasons, but also for practical reasons, because life literally was going to go on for those characters. They had a movie coming out in a few months. This one is from Genetrix. Given how many deleted scenes there are from Star Trek Nemesis that seem to add to the overall film in ways the theatrical release is severely lacking because of the cuts made by the studio and the director to make the film more action-focused, could Nemesis stand to have a final cut-style re-release on Paramount Plus, perhaps? Or do you feel there is not enough there to save the film? Honestly, all of the deleted scenes I've seen from Nemesis are scenes that should have been cut. Like, I can't think of a scene from Nemesis that that was taken out that I think would improve the film if they put it back in. Um... And also, I mean, even if there are deleted scenes that they haven't publicly released that they could put back in, you know, like, are there deleted scenes they could put back in that are going to make that escape from the Romulan ship exciting? Or is that still going to feel flat and flaccid? You know, are there scenes that they can put back in that are going to make the dune buggy drive on the planet when they're collecting B-Force parts make, will, will they make that more exciting? Or no, you know, like there are certain, but will, will, will they, are there things they could add back in that will make that fight with Riker and the Viceroy at the end feel like it means anything, like it belongs in the movie? Um, will, are there deleted scenes they could put back in that will make the movie feel less derivative, less repetitive, um, make the characters feel less randomly out of character. I mean, there, there, there are fundamental problems with that movie and the way it's written and the way it's shot and just the way it's made um, that I don't think could be corrected just by doing an extended cut. I, no, I, just, I think it's just a rotten movie. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, quite often that's what you have. You can't just say, well, put the deleted scenes back in and, you know, and maybe that'll be an improvement. I have not seen any evidence that that would be possible with Star Trek Nemesis. I think it's just a rotten movie. And if you put deleted scenes back in, what you're going to end up with is a longer, rotten movie. Here's a comment from Back Silva. A little late to expect an answer, but I have a question. Was Nemesis really supposed to be an ending for TNG? I've seen it twice now, once as my first contact, hee <laughs> hee, with Trek, and another 20 years later after watching TOS, DS9, TNG, and the movies, and both times it felt like they expected to have at least one sequel, a Star Trek The Search for Data. Nemesis didn't earn that, but that's what Picard's little smile by the end made me feel. It was supposed to be the last one. And if you watch the movie and pay attention to the last movie, if you, I, to me, it, it plays like a last episode. It plays like tying up loose ends. You know, it plays like um, paying off things that have been kind of hanging for a long time, right? For instance, Riker and Troy get married. Tie that up. Right? Riker finally accepts promotion and is getting his own ship and is leaving the Enterprise. Tying that up. Natural endpoint. Not very well done, but, you know, that would be a great natural endpoint. Like, in theory, Riker leaving the Enterprise or Riker getting promoted in some way. You could, you could do it one of a couple ways. You could have Riker get promoted to the captain of another ship and leave the Enterprise. Or you could have Picard leave the Enterprise. Like, either he's retiring or he gets promoted to Admiral and he's leaving the ship, and then Riker is being moved up to Captain of the Enterprise. Either way, it feels like a note of closure. It feels like something is over. Like, the show as it has existed up until now is done, and now it's it's the life goes on turn that was referenced in an earlier question. You know, things are still going to happen. Their, their lives are still going to go on, but something's different now. You know, Riker's leaving. Riker and Troy are married, finally. You know, Data's dead. The relations between uh, the Federation and their longtime enemies, the Romulans, stand at kind of a turning point, and maybe things will be different with them from now on. It feels like a last episode. It feels like an ending. It feels like an attempt at a bookend for this phase of Star Trek. So there's that. There's what I would call, like, 
in-text evidence that this was always meant to be a last episode. And then there's the fact that it was explicitly marketed as the last one. The posters for the movie had the tagline, A Generation's Final Journey Begins. That's what you say about a last episode or a last movie. It was explicitly marketed as the last one. The commercials, you know, the, 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 the marketing for the movie was built around the idea of this is the last one. We are retiring these characters. This is the last time you'll get to see them in a movie. This is it. So it was clearly intended to be the last one. Now, having said that, and here's where I think there's some confusion. They did leave loose ends open. Yes, they did put in the T's with B4, saying data stuff at the end. You know, so there is there is an avenue they have left open. So if they did have the opportunity to come back and they did decide that when they came back, they wanted to bring data back, they've built themselves a little mechanism to do that, right? But that doesn't mean they were planning another movie. That means they were leaving themselves some loose ends. So if this movie did somehow become a massive hit and Paramount came back and said, hey, you know what? They really like the Star Trek stuff again. Let's do another one. They had somewhere to go, you know, but that didn't mean they were planning it or that they never intended Nemesis to be the last one. Nemesis clearly was meant to be the last one. And finally, this one is from Brent Ogg. Nemesis was directed by someone who doesn't know Star Trek. I love when Frakes directs episodes. He knows the subject matter and understands the fans. Terry did an outstanding job on Picard. I cried when the D flew out of space duck. So we're going to disagree on Terry doing an outstanding job on Picard. I do not think that was the case. I think a lot of what he did, especially in the first and last episode of that season, was embarrassing. Um, and also, I don't think it's important that a director understands the fans. I think a director should not worry about the fans one way or the other. A director should worry about the story that they're telling. And therein lies the problem with Nemesis. And I've, I've seen a lot of people, uh, Star Trek fans, a lot of Trekkies... Um, attempt to pinpoint the problem of Stuart Baird as the director of Nemesis. And, and they say he doesn't understand Star Trek or he doesn't know Star Trek. And they point out examples. Like there's a, a really embarrassing director's commentary that he does on the DVD where like he, he doesn't know the names of the characters. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he doesn't know the names of the actors and he just seems lost when he's watching and talking about his own movie. And, you know, people are like, uh, oh, see, he doesn't even know Star Trek. That's not the problem. The problem with Stuart Baird directing Star Trek Nemesis is not that he doesn't know Star Trek. He doesn't need to know Star Trek. He doesn't know the movie he's making. That's the problem. It doesn't matter that he doesn't know who Geordi is because, you know, he hasn't watched every episode of TNG. He doesn't need to have watched every episode of TNG. Jordy is a character in the movie he's making, right? It doesn't matter that he can't remember Michael Dorn's name. So at one point in the commentary, he's, he's naming the various actors in the scene and he gets to Michael Dorn and he blanks and he just goes, and, uh, Worf, right? That's not the fault of, well, he doesn't know Star Trek. He doesn't know the movie he's making. He has a script. He has, a, he has a team of writers. He has a team of producers. He has production team. He has a cast. He has all these things at his disposal. That's his movie. He doesn't have to have seen a single second of Star Trek before this. Okay? That does not matter. And in certain cases, and I think Nicholas Meyer is exhibit A of this, it's, it's, it's an asset. Nicholas Meyer was not and is not a Star Trek nerd. He's the best Star Trek filmmaker ever. He made Star Trek II. He made Star Trek VI. He co-wrote Star Trek IV. He's the best. He's not a Trekkie. What he is, is someone who knows how to make a movie and knows how to tell a story in a movie. That's important. Being a Star Trek nerd is not important. And in many cases, it is a detriment because you end up doing this. You end up playing with your action figures instead of telling a story. So. That's my piece 
on Star Trek Nemesis and Stuart Baird and where he failed as director of that movie. Um, that is also my piece on uh, responding to these comments. That's it. That was the last one. Thank you all so much for watching all my Star Trek videos. Thank you all so much for leaving comments. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. I only respond to a small portion of them in all of these videos, but I promise you, I read them. I appreciate them all. And uh, thank you so much for leaving them and for engaging with my videos. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do videos like this where I personally respond to a few of you. Um, not only do I enjoy doing it, but it's really easy content. So thanks for letting me squeeze an extra video out of this. Oh, it's so good. It feels so good. Um, I will be back uh, soon with another video, another Star Trek related video. In the meantime, uh, if you like my work, you can become a supporter of this channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives or becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. Either way really helps me out, enables me to continue doing this work, um, which I could not do without your support. So one more time, thank you all so much. Thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.